Hi, everybody. I'm Mary Rowe from the Canadian Urban Institute and just so pleased to be with you on this City Talk here, smack dab in Windsor. Now, I'm not actually in Windsor, uh, sadly, uh, because I'm in Syracuse, New York, where my sister is recovering from some surgery. Syracuse is the uh, traditional territory of the Oneida and uh, the ancestral territory of the Oneida and uh, the closest in, uh, uh, the uh, First Nations community is um, the Onondaga. There are several First Nations communities actually up in, up in Upper New York State, for those of you that have come over here uh, to visit. And it's a very interesting time, I would say, for uh, this part of uh, the Northeast um, as we uh, come to terms with the uh, uh, longer term impacts of COVID, but also how are we going to start to come to terms with some of the legacies that predated COVID. And one of those, of course, is um, our capacity, our, our struggles around reconciliation and how do we actually um, uh, uh, find ways as settlers to be present in Indigenous history and Indigenous communities and with different kinds of uh, approaches to city building and what's been so interesting to be in Windsor over the last few days is to start to understand how the Windsor community is coming to terms with practices in urbanism that have been exclusionary that may have been in fact racist and how do we actually do things differently how do we build cities differently build communities differently and uh, one of the important things I think we all know is that we have an attachment to our hometown and I uh, am from London Ontario so I knew Windsor and I've been joking with my Windsor colleagues here that uh, I knew Windsor because I used to kind of compete against Brennan all the time and uh, London kids all came to Windsor and then we would spend time in Windsor and then we'd go across across the river to Detroit uh, so I have a lot of fondness for uh, my memories of this place and so what a great privilege for us at CUI. We're in the connective tissue business. We're about how do we foster learning uh, with city builders in different constituencies and different places across Canada. Uh, and so for us to be able to have this uh, real privilege to be able to be with Windsorites for several days now and listen and learn and hear about what's working, what's not, what are you struggling with, and what do you think is next? So who better then to come back and have some old timers, uh, sorry guys, but just saying, um, some folks who have a long association with this as their hometown uh, to give us their reflections, because sometimes that happens that we see things differently uh, when we've been away and then we come back. And uh, I'm sure Windsor, it sounds to me like Windsor is like many places. It never really wants to lose its grip on people that were raised there. So this session is going to be tremendous. And I'm very excited that I be, I'm uh, able to be part of it. And I'm happy to be listening. I'm going to introduce to you now the uh, host of the session. Thanks for taking the podium. Uh, and I will retreat into the back room and listen with great interest. So fortunately, we have Vince, Vincent Georgie coming in. He is the head of the Windsor Film Festival. Festival. And he's acting associate vice president external at the University of Windsor and the director of the School of Creative Arts and an assistant professor of marketing. He's like a busy, busy guy. And he's been on several sessions over the last couple of days. So uh, I'm really looking forward to the conversation and appreciate all the folks that have agreed to come on with you and give us your unvarnished perspective uh, uh, determined over years of uh, living in Windsor and then living somewhere else. So Vincent, over to you and uh, looking forward to the session. And thanks everybody for joining us. Mary, thanks very much indeed, and thanks for really setting the, the tone of this, and congratulations to both the CUI and the Center for Cities, and certainly to, to my friend Annika Smith on what's already been a very, very successful conference. I'll start off with uh, a land acknowledgement uh, here in Windsor. Uh, the University of Windsor sits on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, which includes the Ojibwa, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. Um, I'm really, really happy to uh, welcome the panelists here, and I want to go right into it. These are all rock stars. I want to go into the meat of the content. We could be nine hours of biographies. So I want to introduce the memorable Jody Butts, the very compelling Julian Villafuerte Diaz, the high-achieving Tiffany Gooch, the brilliant Sean McAuliffe, and the provocative Sean Hertel. All really interesting, compelling people that are going to shake it and kick it around in all sorts of directions. And you all know that I somehow owe someone 10 bucks for, for something. We've got some side bets going on in this thing. I want to go right away. I'm going to go to Jody right away. And I'll start off with the question to the group and, and then putting Jody on the spot. Why did you leave Windsor? How long did you plan on leaving Windsor for? And what, and, and sort of what do you think you're coming back? So, so what prompted the move? And, and how long and what are the return prospects look like if maybe then? Uh, okay, so born and raised in Windsor, lived there for uh, 22 years, uh, MS Hetherington Riverside Secondary School, then to the University of Windsor, uh, and then I left. 
I left for grad school. I went to, uh, to U of T. Uh, then I was in law school and I met a boy. Um, I had, uh, I'd always planned on returning. Um, I considered coming back uh, for law school, but I just thought I hadn't been away long enough. Like uh, my master's was only one year. Um, and, you know, I don't know, like, I don't even know what, what our retirement plans are going to be, we, but the pandemic has made us like start that conversation. Uh, but, but we haven't landed on anything, but I come back as much as I can. And I can say for sure, this is the longest I've ever gone not being in Windsor, like not even once, like it's, it's mind blowing to me. I miss it. Tiffany, to you. Sure. So uh, 20 years in Windsor. Um, I grew up there. My family's five generations deep in Essex County, um, uh, descendant of freedom seekers to uh, the south uh, western Ontario and uh, and very much love the region, love the city. Um, what uh, what started or prompted my my exit was a job. I got a job in Toronto uh, after I graduated graduated from the University of Windsor. Um, I went to John Campbell Elementary, then Kennedy, and then U the University of Windsor, and uh, I just loved politics and found a job after I'd worked uh, um, locally in politics, uh, working at Queens Park in in Toronto, um, and uh, just loved the the work that I was doing. Really fell in love with the city in Toronto, um, and then uh, I think I had a plan to come back. I, I'd sort of set a limit of 10 years uh, away and decided that I was going to come back. And I just calculated last night and realized it's been 11 now. So I, I've overshot by a year. Um, and uh, like Jody, met a boy, um, had a boy uh, just about a month ago. And uh, and so now um, we're in those other conversations too about what it would take uh, for, for both of our careers, for uh, the life we're trying to build for our family moving forward. Um, definitely in the pandemic, uh, landscape thinking very differently about, you know, parent care, um, proximity to family, um, the space that we want for our family and what it means to be uh, close to family. Um, and so I think uh, there's there's a lot of different conversations. I think a lot of it really has to do with uh, job prospects and what we're able to afford. Um, and I think that uh, I also like to think too, though, about um, not just thinking about what jobs are offered, but what uh, um, what what entrepreneurs can do in in the city too of creating jobs as well and and uh, what kinds of opportunities there are there as well. So um, I know we'll kick off lots of different conversations about that moving forward. Um, but yeah, that's my my quick intro. Sean Hertel, to you. Hi, thanks, Vincent. Um, well, I grew up in Harrow, um, so that's Windsor, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's a whole other thing. Um, and my mom's uh, listening. So hi, Ma. Uh, you never really leave home. I went to Hare District High School. I went to the University of Windsor for planning. I was one of the last graduates of the accredited School of Planning, and I hope that that wasn't uh, <laughs> correlated. <laughs> um, but why I left, I think, in addition to not, you know, being able to find a spot to park, I think that's a joke, by the way, I, I think that um, you know, as an urban planner, um, you know, Toronto was the, the place to go. There were projects in Toronto even then before the condo boom um, that would happen in a week that probably wouldn't happen in a generation in Windsor. So, but I must say that I did have an opportunity with the city of Detroit and the town of Leamington. I was very fortunate that in the 90s recession, I, I had three opportunities and one was in Toronto. One was a contract with the, the former Metro Toronto planning department. And I, I figured if I will in, in you know, uh, complete Windsorite fashion, I figured if I didn't take this opportunity to go to Toronto, it would never ever come. And so I, I took it, uh, but my heart, I know this sounds really kind of drippy, but it's the truth. Um, my heart's never left Windsor. Um, when people ask me where I'm from, even though I lived in Toronto for almost 25 years, I never say Toronto. I say, I live in Toronto, I'm from Windsor. So, and that's a, that's a theme. That's a thread that I'm gonna expand on a little bit. But uh, anyway, thank you, Vince. Good stuff. Thanks for set, setting the, the stage for that. Julian, to you. Sure, yeah. Um, so my experience in Windsor, I guess was in two iterations. I grew up there. Um, 
so for you know 18 years in Tecumseh. I went to Lesore. Uh, and then uh, my first leaving of Windsor was for school. And then uh, I went to Vancouver. Um, and I came back for two years to work in Windsor, which was a really, really super interesting experience to kind of, exp uh, you know, to have this like childhood experience and then like a separation and an adult experience, I guess. Um, and then I've just left a year ago again um, to, for school again. I'm at the McGill School of Urban Planning. Um, and yeah, in terms of just plans, like I'm in my mid 20s. I don't have like, you know, plans like, you know, much further than like getting my degree and then seeing where it takes me and like, or my connections will take me. I do uh, have a very deep connection with Windsor. Uh, it's always home. Um, and I think just the two years that I spent, um, you know, is between 2018 and 2020, uh, working in the community was, uh, was really profound. So, you know, that, that will always stay with me and that will always be a reason for me to think about Windsor. And then maybe that will mean, who knows what that will mean. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited for this conversation. Well, then you might not have plans, but I can see you've got a game of Catan in the background and that's really all that matters. Yeah, exactly. Like I do have strategy, um, totally. you know, it helps me be good at Catan. Uh, but totally. as far as uh, where I will be, you know, in terms of what city, like we'll, you know, we'll get there when we get there. We will get there. We'll get there. Last and most certainly not least, Sean Nicholas. Thanks. Um, I was born in Windsor um, a few days after the great tornado uh, of 1974. Um, and left when I was 25, uh, after finishing grad school, I went to high school at, uh, in Tecumseh at St. Anne's, um, and then University of Windsor for undergrad and grad school in poli sci. And when I graduated, um, I think there were two poles for me to leave Windsor. Um, one was a job, uh, if I wanted to do, um, I don't know, anything related to my, uh, degrees, the prospects were, um, better in Toronto um, than in Windsor. Um, but even as I say that, you know, I could, I could have probably stayed and did something, but I also just wanted to live in a really big city. I think, you know, growing up in Windsor, you look over at Detroit, which is, you know, a proper big city, um, and, and which is one of the great things about Windsor that we'll get into, I'm sure, but you're kind of separated from it, right? You can't just go over there and get like a gig or job if you don't have a green card or whatever. Um, so I wanted to live in a city that had millions of people. Um, I also left in 2000, right around when they were tearing down the Norwich block to put up the Chrysler headquarters. So I, I, when I was leaving, I was saying, I'm leaving in protest because they're tearing down this beautiful block for this ugly dud, what became a dud of a building, um, which is a little bit, um, being a bit of a jerk, um, but um, but moving back, I do think about it um, in these romantic moments. I love driving back on the 401 and when everything gets really flat after Chatham and you can start seeing the Detroit skyline and listen to Detroit radio and it feels like home, especially when the corn is growing high. Um, and I think about it, but I'm so deeply rooted in Toronto now with um, relationships and jobs and the, the junk I do, um, it would be hard to extract myself. So I like the idea of being, you know, a dual citizen maybe, or interloping dual citizen. Is there something about being from Windsor that has influenced your interest and in all the work that you've all done around urbanism? Is there something about being from here that has actually influenced the actual career path very specifically versus you being from somewhere else. I see Sean Hertel nodding furiously at that. Let's go to Sean right away with that. Oh, thanks. I think it's my my work ethic, uh, and my I, I'd like to think you know sort of humility and how I approach things, um, embracing grittiness, uh, embracing um, hard work, and a kind of social uh, responsibility uh, to, to one another as citizens. And, and that social responsibility was taught um, at home. Uh, and we were a union family and I was a member of union and it was embedded in me um, in the, you know, the dinners that I would go to with friends and family and how we would treat each other as a sort of an invisible social contract growing up in Windsor is, you know, things were, were hard. Even when things were good, things were hard, um, such as a, a one economy town, right? But you knew that people had your back, right? And, and I think that I bring that or I want to bring that in my practice 
um, as a as an urban planner, um, and also as a teacher. Um, I have the privilege of teaching at three planning schools, and that's what I instill in my students. Um, when we talk about the public interest, the public interest starts with one another, with each other, and and Windsor taught me that. Very very well said. Others, anyone else want to jump in on that? Any reaction? Yeah. Tiffany, go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to jump in and say, I mean, I, I'll, I'll echo uh, what I just heard there, especially on um, on unions and, and labor. And I think my father's an auto worker, so definitely grew up watching how he um, operated in that uh, that joined uh, approach to what uh, how communities come together to build uh, build better lives for each other. Um, but I'd say one one area that I found my work really um, uh, centers on right now is uh, is really understanding the African diaspora in Canada. And I think Windsor has this really incredible history, unlike any other region in the country, um, whereby we have this, this uh, historical Black community, and then the university itself also attracts international students, the, the African diaspora, the di diasporic waves that came over the different decades, um, just intersect in a really incredible way um, in that region. And I think that that's been a lens that I definitely took to all of my work moving forward. Um, and uh, and, and I, I think, you know, of course, that sort of that general multicultural uh, uh, gelling and celebration of all of the, the varying cultures that uh, that intersect in Windsor and have come together to build what Windsor is. Um, and I remember having a conversation with Dwight Duncan about this, and I, I was sort of saying, I feel like every time I'm at a table, I'm, I'm trying to take a Windsor perspective. And he was like, it's not just a Windsor perspective, it's a very Canadian perspective whereby Windsor sort of at the tip of the ship, you know, we experience everything in a very distinct way, but it, uh, but it's still reflected across the country. Um, and so if we're taking that Windsor perspective to, you know, the, the, the political decisions that are being made, um, it reflects uh, in communities across the country as well. And so I think that that's something that I've always taken and have tried to uh, try to continue to take in my writing and in everything that I do. Jody, I saw a reaction there, please. Yeah, you know, well, I think, first of all, uh, you know, I mentioned meeting a boy and that's why I didn't move back. But for sure, being from Windsor was a big part of our attraction for each other. Like, you know, he comes from Cape Breton and a coal mining town and his dad was a coal miner. And, you know, uh, my father worked um, at Ford's. And of course, I say it like apostrophe S because I'm from Windsor. Um, and you know, I think, you know, we, we had kind of known each other and not explained where we were from. And then when we explained where we were from, it was like, ah, like now we're cooking with gas, like we get each other, you know? Um, so, so that's like number one. Number two, um, I remember speaking with, with Alan Wildeman and um, we, were, uh, we were reviewing a submission to, uh, to the Ontario government, trying to explain, uh, you know, there was a question about, you know, um, how are we, living up to certain values. And the language that, that, that we landed on was that, you know, social activism is the oxygen of Windsor. And, you know, once you breathe that oxygen, um, I think number one, um, you really find your voice. You're number two, you're unapologetic about that voice. Um, and you go looking for like-minded people because, um, you know, it, it's a place about collective action, right? It's even though, even though we're like right beside this place that like so much valorizes the individual and, and the individual kind of rising up, you know, Windsor, Windsor is a, I mean, Detroit is too, parts of it, but, but Windsor is very much about that, that collective action and, and that history um, of, um, of collective bargaining and organized labor. And I think the other thing I'll say is that you know, there, there's an identity to being from a border town, like whether you meet someone from Niagara, uh, this idea of living on a border and understanding the differences. And, and you know, uh, you know, I like checkers, but you know, you also like chess because you understand that like there's these two systems and they create opportunities and, you know, sometimes they, they create obstacles too. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I love both of my parents. They're they're both great people, both since past. And, you know, my, my mom came from an enormous family uh, living in a wartime house on Toronto Road. And, you know, 100%, I stand on the, on the very broad shoulders 
uh, of those that gritty to, to borrow Sean's uh, Sean's word and you know tenacious ladies because you know they took they took no shit pardon me but they took no shit they worked hard like the cleanest houses you could always eat off the floor and they took great pride in that and they were always super there for each other and uh and you know i try i may not succeed but i certainly try to adhere to those things uh in everything i do sean mikolov go ahead please yeah, i think uh it windsor's informed the things i do in a few ways one is um the city itself and detroit um watching you know this this great city uh big american city you know rise and fall uh, and then rise again slowly, um, sort of having a front row view of that um, re kind of informs the, you know, the city writing and ex exploration that I, I do up here. Uh, but also, and, and a few people have mentioned this, like the hard times that Windsor has been through, you know, mom worked at GM and, you know, sometimes was laid off and sometimes was not. And my mom still calls and says, like, asks about my friends, is so-and-so working? Is so-and-so working? Um, and I noticed people in Toronto don't ever do that. Whereas Windsor, because of the, the layoff cycles, it was always just a part of the conversation. And, and coming up here, I remember the first like big crisis was SARS back in 2003. And the way everyone was kind of freaking out, like it was this new thing. And I think for those of us who are from Windsor, it was just kind of like normal life, right? To have this uh, up and down. And that sort of I don't know, maybe class approach to things about understanding the precariousness of the world um, absolutely informed um, a book I wrote called The Trouble with Brunch, which was an exploration of class, which has a ton of Windsor in it. I didn't know how to write about class. And I was like, oh, but Windsor is the thing that informed it. Um, so I went back um, and, and dug through that. Um, and, and there was something Jody was mentioning, the border town thing is totally true. Um, I think, you know, the, the most important Canadian relationship is, is the states, right? But for most Canadians, it's somewhat an abstract relationship. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's over there and you can kind of be smug or whatever, like Canadians, whereas like Windsor, it's an everyday lived experience, like, right? There's cross-border dating and cross-border families. And, um, and, and, and you I think, the, one of the great values of coming from Windsor and being in Windsor um, is an understanding of America like most Canadians don't have. And that's really valuable. Yeah, for, for sure, for sure. And I'm, I'm thinking, so thinking about something you've said and, and something Jody said triggered me as well. I'm wondering of what is it in, in, in the cities that you're all living in right now, what is it that they would do well to learn from Windsor? What is it? that whether it's something that Windsor was doing or successful at when you were still living here or how you've seen Windsor evolve, what is it that in the community, and just remind everybody listening what, what city you're living in now, what would the current city you live in do well to take note from Windsor in terms of what we're doing you know, great here? Anyone reacting to that? I'll jump in quickly and say yeah. I'm, I'm in Toronto right now and I'll say uh, protecting your waterfront um, for public use. Uh, I think I, I felt like I just I, I I grew up with having obviously uh, that 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 full path. I could walk from the University of Windsor to my home at at um, uh, uh, Moy and Tecumseh. I would just take the Riverside and and then walk up Moy, um, and uh, and it was just uh, for for any cities that have that space um, and uh, and and sell it off. I think that there's there's always something to be said about uh, ensuring that it continues to be used for public use and uh, um, and keeping it public. And I know that we had to go through a process uh, to be able to make sure that all of that was purchased. Then it could be a become a continuous park. But that's something that I've always um, I wished more cities, not just Toronto, but more cities protected. Definitely one of the striking features of Windsor for sure. I, I couldn't agree more. Anyone else want to respond to that or react to that? Julian, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I live in Montreal. And so I'll combine this answer with like what, uh, like the previous question, which is like, what do you get from Windsor that like makes you, um, you know, compels you into like sort of this like urbanist mindset. I think it's like the contrast from Windsor, Detroit, uh, but also like with other cities. So like with Montreal, it's really interesting or just other places where there is sort of like a priority towards quality of life and a priority towards like the public realm and living in common um, that I feel like growing up in Windsor, it was like 
this is something that I experienced and I did research on this and I actually validated it. Like the experience of a child growing up in Windsor is that it's like quite boring. And it's because it's really related to the auto-oriented component. Like as an adult, it's actually quite a bit more fun. Um, but like a lot of that I think has to do with like this, you know, prioritization of things like, you know, the budget or parking or order as opposed to like just having fun and enjoying life, which I see like, that's like, you know, like living in Montreal, that's kind of like more of a thing that I'm feeling is like just present in space and it's present in people who are just out and every day is kind of like an event. So it's just, I, I think that's just like one thing that maybe like Windsor has already done, you know, exemplified that it is capable of that, like this open streets events, uh, just like last summer in downtown, you know, um, any sort of festival, like all those are great examples that the people are, you know, they're excited to experience that and to have that as be a regular thing. But I think that's something that we should move more towards. I agree more. Others, anyone else want to react to that? Sean Mikulov, go ahead, yeah. Um, I've always appreciated the, well, I appreciated it once I left and moved up to Toronto, how much the, I guess, people mix in Windsor. Um, and again, this will be a perspective that different people might disagree, disagree with, uh, but especially like from a class and kind of subcultural perspective, like um, used to hang out at the Loop in Windsor and uh, where like all like the raver kids and, and metal kids and whoever else, you know, would kind of mix through that place. Whereas it came to Toronto and like there was, everyone had their own kind of thing going on. But, deeper, like the sort of social and class mixing, um, you know, my dad worked at Hiram Walkers and they had like internal clubs for bowling and hockey. And when we, the, you know, the kids of rank and file union members would play alongside the kids of the executives, right? And there's like this kind of mixing that I think does not exist up here, um, mm -hmm. or at least not in the same way, right? You have, I was, I was flabbered when I'm just, I, I still am um, amazed at the amount of money um, in Toronto, it blows my mind. Um, but but the entire world that, you know, the money kind of classes in, in Toronto can live with and never understand that there's an entire working class here. And I think that's kind of really contributed to some of the um, economic disparity, uh, especially that COVID has really brought out um, because it's easy to live in, a, easier to live in a bubble here, whereas Windsor, um, there isn't as much of a bubble. Sure. Jody, to you, what is it that Ottawa needs to learn from Windsor? Um, I think what it needs to learn from Windsor is that when- And that's not meant to be a loaded question. No, 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 no. <laughs> when you've been gifted like a stable workforce, like that, that, you know, generally speaking, you know, people are earning, um, you know, good amounts of money. Like you need to, you need to give back to the whole city. So I, I'm picking up on, on what Sean says. I, like I, I look at the city of Ottawa, it doesn't even have an anti-poverty strategy. And you're like, guys, like you don't know how much you could unlock. It's like, it's like someone owning a house in Toronto and not understanding you could have a mortgage. Like, you know, like, and you could unlock the value of your house. Well, we there, there's so much value in having this non-cyclical economy in um, this tax base and just individually, you know, the, this ge generally undisrupted um, family incomes, I just think it could probably do a lot more. But there's a lot about Ottawa that reminds me of Windsor. And, you know, the river is a big part of it. Um, I loved when the Ganacho Trail was like first put in place. I grew up on the East End. And, you know, uh, Ottawa certainly really embraces that kind of walking, pedestrian, bicycling um, aspect. Um, and, you, and you do see people out and, and about, you know, using them particularly during the pandemic, but, but, but even before. So, so there, there, there are a lot of similarities, but, but it could really kind of dig in to get more of that whole of city and that and what Sean was talking about that that mixing of the of the different neighborhoods and, and it's it's got the firepower to do it. Sure. Sean Hertel, how about you and your reaction? Um, just quickly, I agree with everything I heard. Um, I think um, Windsor actually and I think we'll get into this. Um, Windsor has very few lessons I think to offer uh, other places, especially when it comes to sort of my wheelhouse, which is urban planning. I trust there'll be an opening there. Um, but I, I will say that Windsor takes care of stuff. I'm um, growing up in a, um, in a 
you know, not a uh, rich family, uh, as many of my colleagues can relate to, working class, working hard. Um, there wasn't a lot of money for things, but if we needed something, we always got it, right? A new sweater, our shoes were worn out, or we needed, uh, you know, money for a field trip. We always had that, right? And, uh, and Windsor takes care of things, its parks, its streets. And I think where I am right now in Toronto, um, Toronto can learn from that. And, and I think it's absolutely disgustingly shameful of all the wealth that Toronto has and it can't even pick up the garbage in its goddamn park. Sorry, mom, for swearing, but it's infuriating. Uh, it's immoral, right? And that would never happen in Windsor. Well, let's walk through the door that, that Sean just opened. The, the timing is actually uh, perfect. All of you being beloved relatives at a distance right now, what are you seeing going on in the home base that concerns you? And you want to send the red flag with a little bit of love of say, hey, Windsor family, what's going on with that from an urbanism perspective? Anyone want to jump in? I'm seeing a lot of smiles. I'm seeing the wheels turn. Uh, before somebody says this, yeah. transit, transit, transit public transit. <laughs> um, I said earlier that I like to walk from the university to my house. It was because my commute by way of, of the transit system was uh, unbelievable. Um, and uh, and to think that at that point into to now, uh, there still hasn't been bold enough leadership uh, to uh, to ensure that our public transit system in Windsor is, uh, is is prepared to move people in the ways that the future requires, um, the present and the future requires is uh, is just disappointing. And I know at the university side, there have been you know conversations again and again about you know universal passes for students and how it's going to be funded. But I think even beyond the student conversation, um, of course I can appreciate that it's uh, an auto city, but uh, I I also I think it's important for us to appreciate. I never owned a car while I lived in. Windsor. Um, I still don't own a vehicle, um, and uh, and part of the most the most difficult parts for me was uh, was that it was just so hard to get around the city, um, and uh, and that we just we weren't even having the conversations about uh, improving that. Um, and so I'm I'm waiting for that that critical mass moment of leadership that everyone's sort of able to come together and say that uh, we need to do better. We need to connect these communities. We need to ensure that especially um, that first of all the infrastructure we're building connects to transit but also transit is connecting to the uh, the infrastructure we're building it's just not uh, it's just not happening and, uh, and and that's been something that's really concerned me for for some time as it should Sean Nicola to you what are you responding to yeah just uh, Tiffany when you look at the old maps of um, where the streetcars used to go in Windsor um, you could take a streetcar to Tecumseh and Kingsville and Amherstburg on a little electric trolley 100 years ago um, but that's again, that's a Ontario Canadian problem too that we did that and in this next problem land use planning in in Windsor um, is also a Canadian and Ontario disaster but it seems more profound I think in Windsor because the effects of one decision uh, have maybe a bigger um, crater and I think in thinking of the hospital um, and the sort of abandonment of the the core of the city like Windsor has a like the most, a stunning core it sits there and it looks at Detroit it's the best you know, view of from Canada anywhere, if, unless you're into mountains and other stuff. Um, but um, to to put it out in a, in a, uh, uh, a field, you know, a, a really valuable farm field um, is is it kind of that blows my mind a bit. So uh, land use planning and I guess smaller decisions like not lowering the speed limit to 40. There was a decision a few years ago not to um, beautify Wyandot, kind of making it look like um, St. Catherine in Montreal with kind of like decorations over it. That would have brought so many people down. Um, and so I think there's like little decisions like that, that um, there's some people working very hard on them in Windsor. Um, and it's, they don't have the critical mass that a, say a, play, a bigger place will have um, to, to make them happen. Um, so those kind of a couple of big things and, and, but a lot of like little decisions like that. You're muted, Vincent. Sorry about that. Yeah, a lot wants to respond to there. Julian, how about yourself? Yeah. Um, so I guess like building on on what was just said is like the there is a it's there's a really important place for centering conversations of poverty and inequality, uh, which are really serious problems in Windsor. 
uh, centering those in sort of like policy discussions. And that's something that I don't think is like happening when you see like how that's happening in other places, how like measures of equity and like, you know, just a real sincere posing of the question of who benefits and is this fair um, is something that ha is happening in other places, which is important because like inequality is something that undermines any sort of goal that you want to have regarding prosperity, fairness, climate action, anything. That is just not, I don't think that's something that's really happening in Windsor. Um, my impression is that there's a lot of, you know, these kind of like gestures towards these issues, but they're as gestures that are isolated from actual decisions. So like, you know, going back to the land use planning thing, going back to transit, like that's, uh, you know, how, how much is, um, how much is that a part of those conversations um, in, in the question of leadership? Like it is a growing and like, you know, a very alive part of the conversation in terms of just like community members and community activists. But um, to see that not being like kind of adopted into the bigger, uh, like the, the discourse and the sort of decision making that, um, you know, decision makers are making in Windsor is, is a little concerning. So, you know, I'm really, but I am hopeful that it's like, it's coming, like, but it's just, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's almost like, it, you know, at some point things become too late, right? And then you pay the price. Jody, how about you? What do you need to send back to the motherland of Windsor? Um, well, I would for sure, uh, so I do not have the background or the expertise that, that my fellow panelists do, but I would for sure like some sort of green belt or some sort of belt around Windsor. Um, and I would say, you know, Windsor, I would just love if it thought more about the first impression it made on people, because I'm always like, you know, cheerleading and stuff, but I feel like people all like I, I'm trying to make up for a deficit because they came in along here on church or they landed at the airport and there's kind of nothing there. There's nothing that tells the story of Windsor. Uh, you're kind of dropped in the middle and then you go through strip malls, right? Um, and even the train station and kind of, it's like kind of nestled in this really interesting spot, like historically, you know, from, you know, Hiram Walkers and the role of Walkerville, but you never kind of get that story and your cab is probably going to take you through your wine dot, which, you know, I think Sean just mentioned, you know, there's the decision to, to not beautify. So, you know, just, just maybe being a bit more intentional around um, the first impression it makes. And yeah, like just, just kind of stop, stop the, the, the never ending sprawl. Somebody in the chat said, you know, like, like climate change is terrible, but like Windsor can probably will kind of oddly benefit from it. Like, I think it'll continue to have a good climate, even in this disrupted context, it's, it's going to be like a really good place to live, but, but you gotta, you gotta keep that parkland. You gotta keep that farmland. It, it can't, can't be a sprawling city or, or nobody's, no, no, nobody's going to see Windsor as part of, of a solution. They're always going to see it as part of the problem. Sean Hertel, you opened up this door for us. Where are you at on this? Uh, hey, well, um, I'll need nine hours, so I'll, let me start. Uh, in planning school uh, in the mid-90s, the big thing downtown, uh, Toronto, uh, there was a Toronto firm, uh, the Killer Bees, they were called, um, Brownwood Burke Bainan, uh, Calvin Brook, um, I forget what he calls himself now, but they were hired by the city of Toronto, uh, city of Windsor, John Milson, Mayor Milson, uh, they had the twin anchor plan downtown when uh, the casino was dangled downtown to uh, Windsor. So it was the West anchor would be the uh, would be the uh, new arena. The East anchor would be the Caesars um, uh, casino where, where it is now. Um, and, you know, the only thing that happened was the casino. And then Windsor said, well, that's the plan. Okay, let's screw it up, but let's intentionally screw it up and not invest our political courage and capital imagination in the plan that we paid for. Um, and then let's just, you know, whine about how Windsor has this bad reputation, right? And that still has gone on and on and on. And I'm looking at the 20 year strategic plan of council and fixing Windsor's reputation is priority number two of three. And the thing is, the very people who wrote this are responsible for its bad reputation. Like, it's just driving me nuts. I'm sorry, but this is just infuriating to me. Um, and so uh, Sean mentioned uh, tearing down the Norwich block. Yeah, we have this great historic block. Yeah, let's tear it down. 
Um, let's also tear down our only, um, one of the only flat iron, true flat iron buildings in, in the country, uh, in Walkerville. And uh, let's uh, put a bench and some sod there. Um, so excellent, perfect, let's do that. Um, let's put our arena um, out uh, in the suburbs and have everyone drive there and worry about parking, perfect. Um, oh gee, why don't we have nice things? Like, come on story but i mean we have to get angry i think and 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 uh, anarchy said that we have to get into this panel uh, to be honest but also with love and that's where i'm coming from um we can't John, stop problem. holding back be more blunt, we, we 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 can't solve a problem if we don't know what it is okay we have to name it Windsor does not have a resource problem. Windsor does not have a talent problem. Windsor does not have an identity problem or an excitement problem or a history problem. It has a courage and imagination problem. It, it wants people to believe in it. It has to first believe in itself. That's the problem. We're, we're, we're too occupied with what other people think of us instead of paying attention to what we think of us. Well, let's address that head on. I, I, I can speak to it. I moved here from Montreal 12 years ago. When I first got here, I was told that it's a great city, but we're smaller than Toronto. To which I, I honestly didn't really know how to react. I'm like, you know, so is every other city in the country. I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't actually understand the comment as good or bad. I just didn't know why it was even being made. So let's address that, that really good point that Sean's made head on. How do we just all move on from this? This identity thing, this inferiority complex, whatever. Like, how do we keep on walking? How do we just like what? Why is that dude, still dude, brewing? Dude. Exorcism. Nothing short of an exorcism. When when Ford left Windsor, I, I believe this is my this is my own view. It is not like PhD research back, but I feel when Ford packed up and left Windsor there was a psychological inju injury to this city and it is passed on from generation to generation because Windsor rocks and it rocked for a number of reasons. It is a place of enormous creativity. So, um, I mean, what, what, what you're doing now, Vincent, but you know, back in my day, you know, like the Windsor Film Theater, like crazy billboards that, that were being put up that like were legendary, like, great artists and and you know um and that's not even talking about Detroit like like that's not even getting to the DIA or, or, or Motown or, or, or any of that it is it is a place um of activism it is a place of great food like it's so much great food so much great music I've never lived in a place that's even had like adequate radio and that probably sounds like oh you know a little bit kind of one percent or whatever no radio is my life. Like I need a soundtrack to my life and I prefer it from radio. I don't want to curate it myself. I actually want it to come from the airwaves, but Windsor, but, but Windsor always feels like it's awesomeness is not recognized. Um, and it just, and, and that, that, chip that isn't owned by one person or one governing body it's like it's it's a psychological injury injury but it has so much to be proud of so much to be proud of and so much to build on anyone else want to jump in on that i i i think i would say i I don't know if it's just the people that I'm following on Twitter right now, but my the, the I, I'm sensing that there is a new generation of leadership that's ready to take over and has a, a vision for what could come next. And I think that a portion of this is also trusting that group, trusting that new generation. And it's generational, it's gendered too. I, I think when I think about the uh, um, the municipal council, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing them start to take those mantles. Um, I, I'm, I'm waiting for the moment that a woman is ready to just just jump into that mayoral race so I can come down and, and do and do whatever is necessary to get her elected um, and uh, and really just allow us to start uh, letting this new group that sees what the future is going to require that's thinking generations ahead instead of generations back and and is, is ready to make uh, make the decisions that are needed so I I, I really trust actually that 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 talent that the leadership is there I, I echo what I heard from Jody about 
the artistic talent that exists in the city. Um, the the uh, art behind me, the Toronto uh, posters are made by a Windsor artist that moved to Toronto and then has his his art in the art gallery in Windsor and then sold at the CN Tower. And I, I he started his work in in Windsor, Scotty Graham. And I'm I'm just I'm thinking so much about all of these great folks that um, are ambassadors to our work. That um, that talent it still exists in the city itself too. And uh, and I think it's also just a willingness to trust that that generation and and put them in leadership, um, not ask them to keep waiting and learning anything. They're ready, um, and uh, and that's what I'm really looking forward to. And you, you've touched on a really important point there, Tiffany, uh, on the generational change, which is key, and also thinking of too all of the different actors in the community that are not from here who don't have these preconceived notions until they're actually forced onto you. And that's something to be thoughtful of. Just one thing, just with my university hat on, the vast majority of our faculty are not from here and are delighted to be here and thrilled to be here. And it's interesting when you get here, you're given the list of all the wonderful things, but then these other things that, that sort of brew and sort of you're infecting new, fresh-eyed, bushy-tailed people with this idea of, well, here are all the things that you know, won't work out for us. And it's actually a bit mystifying. And there's only so long you've got before you break people, but you got to you know, keep pushing, pushing it. We all have to collect it and keep pushing against that. Um, thanks for comments, Tiffany, very much. Uh, Sean McLeod, to you. Yeah, it, I've been impressed since I left that the that younger generation um, or generations now um, have been kind of doing stuff that um, that that were absent when I was there. I just took this off my wall here. Um, it's like it's pick. Uh, I don't know who did this, but some Windsor artist and a friend gave it to me. Uh, you know, just like, this is like kind of branding exercises, but like from DIY uh, uh, level and just, you know, kind of loving that, like getting the city to fall in love with itself um, is important. That's something we've, uh, I've, with some people in this magazine we started up here called Spacing, I tried to get Torontonians to do because Toronto, despite its reputation, also has the same problem of self-loathing, um, uh, but in a kind of different way. Um, but you need this, a city to be in love with itself, to like living there, to be proud of it, to get a kick out. Like that's why the Windsor pizza thing is is so great, right? It, it's it's um, it's maybe you know it, it's it's fun rivalries with did Chatham start the Hawaiian pizza I don't know um, and the differences with Detroit pizza but having like these things to to kind of give you permission to be in love with the place will keep people engaged for the political fight I think because if you don't have like a silly picture of a minivan on your wall um, or or whatever else um, why would you fight for um, you know a lower speed limit or some beautification or something like that. So um, kudos to all the, 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 the artists and creators who are putting out these little things on your own. It's great. Cool, and how about yourself? Anything to jump into here? Um, yeah, just echoing what everybody is saying about, um, I guess, attitude and courage, imagination. Um, you know, one thing I guess is like there, like I think there's a little bit of a political debate in Windsor about like how it should regard itself because there are serious problems to focus on. So it's like not helpful to ignore them either, but it's also really bad to be like totally negative and pessimistic because then like, if you don't, like the city has to, in order to be successful, like there has to be love for each other and love for oneself and like one love for the collective by the collective. Um, I believe that. Um, and I believe that it's also possible because there's like many things that are really lovable about Windsor. And I think it's interesting, I, I, I forget exactly who said it, um, the, maybe it was you Vincent, like the idea that like, oh Win yeah, you did say it, like Windsor, you know, you know, Windsor is Windsor, but it's smaller than Toronto. It's like, it doesn't, that doesn't have to be a but, it can be an and, you know, those things are, you know, these things that may be construed as negative could actually be like really positive in a general sense. So, uh, so yeah, like it's just an attitude thing. Um, and yeah, and it's nice. Like, I really do think that like, you know that perspective is changing. Like Windsor has like a really cool arts community and it's like, and I, you know, I, like I'm really excited about the new generation of political change too. I think it's gonna bring um, a lot more of that positivity. I think a lot more just like joy and playfulness too. I think, you know, maybe Windsor needs to see a little bit more of that. Just like, like, you know, just like how, how, how do we enjoy life here? How do we enjoy each other? How do we be playful? You know, how do we not be so serious? Um, yeah, because I think that's like one thing that's like, you know, I see in other places, uh, Windsor could do well to adopt that a little bit. 
Julian, I think it's a good point. I mean, a lot of it does come down to how the narrative is framed and sort of how we, we, we frame these comparisons and what we accept as comparisons that are supposedly better, worse, or equal to us. I think if, if there's a piece. Well, let me ask, uh, let, let, let's tackle with for the, I mean, we don't have that much time left, but let's sort of tackle a, a key issue that's sort of at the root of all this, which is around uh, talent uh, attraction and talent retention. We've got two great institutions of higher education here in the, in the community, both St. Clair College and the University of Windsor. Uh, so many of my students for the past 12 years I've been here, given the choice, would love to stay in Windsor. That I had that myth dispelled me actually very, very quickly. People were like, oh no, if I had a great option for, for employment here, I'd love to. There's so many things that matter. Can't just be for a job, but that, you know, that's obviously domino one. And the same thing for a talent attraction standpoint. You know, so many major employers in the community looking to bring in the best talent. And uh, having an outstanding city is critical for, 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 for attracting the quality of talent that you want. How do we tackle this? It's a big one, and we're we're not going to get over it anytime soon. What's the approach on the on the uh, the attraction and the retention piece? What's got to happen? Like Sean Mikolaf, yeah. Um, I mean, we've talked about this before, but um, you know, walkable communities, these kind of really interesting strips, Ottawa Street, Wyandotte, both East and West, um, Ouellette, um, and, and you know, parts of Tecumseh Road and, and other parts of it, and Drulard now. Um, these are, these are great uh, North American streets, right? Uh, classics. Uh, the kind of places in, in booming cities that are becoming too expensive to live in. That's the, 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 those are the, the places that are attracting, you know, younger people. Um, and it, it's not like these kind of big mega projects uh, that pull those people and pull that kind of talent in. That, that doesn't really solve the job side of it. Um, but that's, the, uh, but that's the kind of um, place that, that people want to live. They don't want to have to be in their car um, for everything, for, for, for a bottle of milk or, wh or whatever else, or just to go out to dinner. Um, so it comes back to like the thing I said before about like, you know, these, these great streets uh, of Windsor um, should not be sort of politically abandoned, um, uh, which it seems like from the, some of the leaders uh, it is. William, how about yourself? Yeah. So, um, yeah, just like a plug for, or, so I spent, when I was a year, in, in Windsor, I spent one year doing research on specifically this topic. So it's very close to my heart. Um, and I think, yeah, it does boil down event, like to quality of life, like the, you know, Sean mentioned walkability, I think is key. And it does solve the jobs issue. Like if, you know, if we're thinking about it from a very like human capital perspective, like, like, especially, um, you know, high, high achieving people in the sort of sectors that Windsor specializes in, like in manufacturing and then hopefully eventually tech. Like if you bring those people that like their work produces other opportunities for other people, i.e. other jobs. Um, so yeah, and it boils down, I think, to quality of life. It's really cool to see that that's like, you know, becoming a really central part of the conversation about economic development in Windsor now with Windsor Works. Um, but I think, yeah, like we could do more to sort of highlight, like, it's not, you know, it's not a question of like, investing millions of dollars into more like destinations as amenities like the amenities that like people are excited about like and I've done I've done many focus groups with like you know like cherry pick people to represent like what Windsor is and like what people are really excited about it's like for example like Muskoka chairs on the waterfront uh, rooftop patios things that are just like a question of like oh, also like you know walkability which are not a question of like additional investment it's just a question of like small investments in like street furniture uh regulatory changes and like a reallocation of like the amount of money that like windsor spending on like cars cars are extremely expensive to like you know to have infrastructure for and that's a really like a big like part of the issue in windsor about like why there's such a you know this like crisis of infrastructure and a crisis of budget um shifting that is like not only good for the budget, but it's also good for quality of life, which is also good for talent attraction, which is also good for economic growth. And like, you know, and if we can all tie that and be conscious of like not like worsening the situation of, of socioeconomic inequality through gentrification, which is a whole other conversation, then Windsor puts itself in a really good spot, I think. I mean, even pointing to the euphoric reaction of the community to having more patios downtown last summer. I yeah. mean, it was just patios. The world did not end, nothing burnt down, everyone was okay. There were not 5,000 more car accidents because there were now patios downtown. Um, yeah, sometimes it, it is the small things indeed. Jody, how about you? How do we get the, the talent attraction, talent retention piece done? I think we also just need to tell our story better. So, so I will pick up on the points of, I don't think it's about you know big money projects or those kinds of things. I think it's 
you know, I, I mean, look, I, I'm a bit of a history buff. Maybe, maybe I'm just coming at it from too uh, personal of a place, but like, you know, like Windsor was such a, you know, like in its history, it's been an interesting place in terms of labor activism, in terms of prohibition, um, in terms of, you know, it, it's a, you know, it's original, um, you know, it's original beginnings as, uh, as an indigenous uh, place of commercial activity. Um, you know, it, it, it's gone through all of these different changes. And I just, I think people like, I think people can get into that. Maybe, maybe I'm biased. Somebody asked, like, like when you leave, do 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 you kind of put on rose colored rose colored glasses? Yes, I, I'm sure I do. I'm not living there every day. I, I it's it's not the same. I'm not going to have the same viewpoint on, on its problems, and that's for sure my bias. But um, I just think there's there's a lot of good there. I think it has to tell its story a little bit differently. I think the most exciting thing we've heard in this whole conversation is about um, new, new leadership, like a, a new generation of leadership coming up. Um, I'm not disparaging current uh, leadership, but th there's one thing that, that that's always 100% true. And, and if you're looking for sustainability, if you're looking for growth, you generally have to look to the future uh, to, to find those answers. Sean Hertel or Tiffany, any, any thoughts about how to tackle the bear that is the uh the uh, talent retention and talent uh, attraction piece. Uh, I'll go first here and I'll just yeah. say, actually, I think we're, um, I think we're about to see a, a, an influx actually right now. And, and I think the pandemic is going to play a role in that. That's, um, that's young families that want more space because they value it differently now that they've, you know, had a moment where they, they were trapped in uh, small apartments and um, are making their first purchases and, and looking at the winter market and thinking about whether they could set up shop now that they work from home for as long as they have and, and are considering uh, where they need to be and whether or not they can have a business in Windsor and, and, and have it be worldwide. Um, um, I think uh, the, our, our parents and as our parents age, um, we'll be thinking very differently about um, uh, the living situations that we'll be having as families into the future um, and, uh, and how we care for um, our uh, older generations. Um, and so I, I think that there's, there's uh, I've, I've always noticed that anywhere I lived after I left Windsor, I still had a little community of Windsorites that I, I, I had around me. Um, and a, a good half of those people that are my age right now are, are moving back to Windsor right now, that are, are they're buying their homes, they're moving. So I think um, they're, they're on their way. Um, and how do we ensure that uh, the, the, the things that had them leave in the first place don't, um, don't become reasons that they leave again? And so um, I do think that in some ways, um, for me at least, uh, parts of what I've left about Toronto have been um, the ways within which the communities uh, that I, I needed to, um, I, I'm, I'm, I find myself best, my best creativity comes from being with other artists, being around other thinkers. And um, I wonder where the spaces for cross-pollinization of ideas are in Windsor. Where do you come together with other thinkers and other creatives and uh, and, and others that are, are like-minded? Um, it's not necessarily just going to be on a patio. Is the University of Windsor going to play that role of bringing speakers together and, and having spaces for people to come together to? Um, will, will it be that small businesses will start and little bookstores and things like that that bring together um, uh, that idea generation. Um, and so I, I, when I think about what, what that next phase of what community building is going to look like for this new group that's on its way back, um, I, I, I'm really thinking too about what, where those spaces are that they come together um, after, uh, after that we're, we're past this pandemic moment where we're not coming together physically. Let's go into that a little bit, Tiffany, because that sort of ties into the, 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 the whole talent piece. What is it that's driving people back? Like, what are these moments where it's like, you know, everyone, you know, people left, went on to, to, to other projects, other jobs, other, other, other romances, what have you. What are the key drivers that are now having people say, I've been away for X years, now it's time to come back. What are you, what are you folks seeing or sensing? Or uh, for people that you know that are moving here for the first time, what is driving that? What are you folks seeing and sensing? Tiffany or anyone actually. 
I mean, I'll answer right now and just say, yes, uh, affordable housing, um, the ability to have a little bit more space for your family. I didn't think I had a large backyard when I was growing up and suddenly it feels like I'm, I had a massive backyard when I was growing up in winter and I want that for my son. Um, and uh, and so I think there's uh, that's one piece, but I do, I do think family connection. Um, the pandemic has absolutely shifted how we feel about our proximity to family, how we care for family. Um, I think, uh, I, I, I don't think we can we can put this elephant out of the room right now. Um, we, we we put a lot of our, our elders together in spaces that ended up being unsafe for them in this pandemic reality. Um, are we going to want larger homes that we can have our, our families all in the same place together and, and not to make decisions about what their um, their care looks like uh, and, and think differently about that. So I think um, when my sister and I have this conversation, it very much is uh, we, we've got aging parents, we've got aging um, aunts and uncles and and we want to be closer to them um so so what are those uh what are the tough choices we would need to make for for our um our living situations to make sure that we're able to support them um like jody as she said i i don't think i've been to windsor in a little while i came back very briefly for my wedding in windsor in in november um the six guests <laughs> were of course my parents and my brother um and uh and and i think now where whereas before i had very quick visits into the city to see everybody and and very quickly make my way back um, now it's it's so important to me that my, my my child really knows their cousins and really knows their um, the the community that raised me um, and uh, and the pandemic has really shifted how we feel about how quickly we can get in and out and uh, and really has a, a new sense of what it means to be able to connect with family I'm just picking up on something that you shared there Tiffany because it's really important and, and folks in the chat are jumping in on that too it seems locally for everyone that's still back in, in the motherland everyone feels that housing has become completely unaffordable that everything has changed so much it's completely unattainable yet there still is the perception positively from people from people other communities moving here of Windsor is so much cheaper isn't that going to be a big plus is it, are both actually true? Is it just sort of relative? Is it a question that Windsor's housing market cost-wise has just caught up or is it off the rails? Like where, where are we at with that? Because on the ground, it's absolutely, you know, the housing market's out of control, it's unattainable, everyone's been phased out. But then externally, there's still this sort of paradise of move to Windsor and, you know, the backyard and, and, and the whole bit will be happening for you tomorrow. Um, how do we reconcile that? Or what are anyone's thoughts on that? in any which way, shape, or form? I think um, the answer yeah, is yeah, yeah. It's a, a relative question, right? Um, yeah. Because the thing is that like, yes, it's becoming increasingly, you know, housing, uh, owning property is becoming increasingly unattainable in Windsor, which is a problem, uh, but it's even worse elsewhere. So it's, you know, it's like it completely, you know, uh, it's like becoming to the point of like inconceivable to like own property, for example, in places like Toronto. So that's what, um, yeah, and that came out like in the in the research I did. That was the number one driver of people going back. Is that like you know they 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 may have liked Windsor, but there's like you know other opportunities elsewhere. But then they realize like I can't even pursue these opportunities elsewhere. It's too unaffordable. I have to move back to Windsor if like you know if I'm going to like have a you know the best kind of future for myself. So so that's um yeah that's what I heard. So others on the housing piece or on the piece around what's driving people back or coming here for the first time, Sean McLeod, yeah. yeah. I'm struck by this because I've been paying a lot of attention to it up here in Toronto and the sort of disheartening thing through the pandemic of people leaving Toronto um, because you know the, the great things about living in the city are gone, the kind of public life and all you're left with is the hassle from expensiveness to the other things. Um, and um, what I'm, you know, for people who have like left to go to small towns in Nova Scotia, that kind of dreamy, whatever, um, I, were, I wonder if like when the pandemic's done and the city comes back, um, are those people going to be like, oh, I actually liked living in a city, um, right? I, you know, there, despite the hassle, there's this kind of trade off between the two things. Whereas people who moved to Windsor, um, they still got the city. Right, this it's it's a real city and it has like city life in it. Um, so I think that's an advantage that Windsor has that you know the the kind of utopic moving to a small you know village or town somewhere in in Ontario and leaving the big city. Windsor has an advantage there that it has it's a little bit more humane at that level, despite the local you know rise in in um, affordability and and other things. Um, and uh, yet it still is a big city. And of course, there's the big, big city uh, across the river. 
Fair enough. Others. Sean Hartel, any reactions to this? Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot going on here, but what I'll say is one of the larger themes of the CUI event in, in, in Windsor is mid-sized cities. And I think that there is a rescaling um, happening that is um, everyone supposes, you know, um, uh, theorists and planning says everything needs to, everything scales up. But I think what's happened is COVID has taught us that there is a there there needs to be a Goldilocks condition. And I think that a Goldilocks condition exists in mid-sized cities such as Windsor, and that they are large enough where there is a critical mass of stuff and chaos to make things interesting and to have a rewarding life and to experience um, something we're sharing with other people. And yet small enough that you can actually roll up your sleeves and get in on it, participate in it, and feel like you have a chair whether it's what Julian was saying, whether it's a Muskoka chair on the Detroit River or a, or, a, or a bench next to a friend on the rooftop patio, quite literally and figuratively have a place for you. Um, I took my planning students from Ryerson University on a field trip a few years ago. And I think I disappointed and pleasantly surprised a lot of people because um, there, but New Orleans and San Francisco and France were destinations. I took my class to Southwestern Ontario in Detroit, and I actually had people sign up willingly <laughs> to come. Those poor, those poor kids. I had the smallest group, but I think we had the most fun. We went to London, we went to um, Stratford, Kitchener, Windsor, and of course Detroit. And I, I said to them, I said, mid-sized cities, it's where it's at. And this was before COVID. And I said, this is where as a planner, you can actually really affect change and participate and have experience and they're perfectly scaled. And I said that, um, you know, if you were to pick one, you might as well pick Windsor because the pizza is the best, right? And I stand by that. Um, so I think that Windsor and mid-sized cities in general are having a bit of a moment, um, you know, a moment that uh, other cities in Canada like Saskatoon and Regina have had, and I think it's our turn. Um, and uh, I'm really excited, and I think it's time for the new generation to uh, uh, to 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 kind of in a in a hostile, friendly way take over and uh, boot uh, boot the old white guys out of um, city council. Uh, I took a, a look at the uh, picture of the um, of the, the the leadership. I say that. Kind of loosely, um, of city of, of of city council, and I was just like, "Oh my God, really? Like, what year is this? 1936? Like, come on, it's time to make room." Uh, Windsor has been has been a tradition, traditionally a city of the future. It had the very it had one of the world's first electrified streetcar fleets, and I believe the year was um, 1886, 1889. Um, it it mass produced credit, it mass produced frozen peas and marsh frozen foods, it mass produced mobility and Fords and, and Chryslers. <laughs> um, and yet somehow it's lost that. It does not look to the future anymore and it's time to. And the old, the old white guy's gotta go. Uh, and I'm an old white guy, but it's time, it's time to, it's time to let the new generation take over. And ironically, going back to our past in Windsor is really going to the future. Well, let, let's pick up on that because we'll go to Jody, and then we're gonna pick up on something Sean just said. Jody, to you, yeah. I, I just, I just wanna make a quick comment. Yeah. Um, you know, I would just implore the leadership and, and everybody uh, who's living in Windsor, really watch this affordability problem because to me, what has made Windsor historically so significant is that it is a place of opportunity, like accessible jobs, low barrier jobs to lead a good life. You can go to university at home. You can go to a good college at home. Uh, mm -hmm. You wanna learn about a symphony, you can walk across the bridge and you can go and learn about a symphony. It's just, you know, like, I'm probably romanticizing it a bit again, but I, I really felt like the world was my oyster there. I could tap into so many things. I think historically that has been true as well. There has been 
lots of barriers too. Um, but that 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 engine of economic of accessible economic opportunity and accessible education um, is I, I feel it's it's essential to 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 Windsor maintaining its uh, peculiar and and special uh, perch. It needs to be protected for sure. Picking up on something Sean started to touch upon, how can we take better advantage and include Windsor diaspora? We're always there's always trumpeting in some one report or another that it's the fourth most diverse city in Canada, and there's sort of different stats that sort of you know support that in different ways. Um, but how can we really build our city in a way that really actually reflects the actual diaspora of the community? Again, big question, but how do we how do we start how do we start tackling it? I don't know, Sean said it, it's a hostile takeover. I, <laughs> I think it's, it's just time for, um, and I don't know if there's more training programs for politics that'll be um, helpful uh, locally, but there's so many online even um, in terms of uh, learning how to, you know, run strong campaigns and, and they're changing completely right now by way of the pandemic anyway. Um, and it will be a new generation that is able to take advantage of uh, of the ways that campaigning is shifting. But um, it is that that's, that's probably the, the most difficult thing to be watching is knowing how uh, celebrated and how diverse our our, uh, our, our city is um, and how that is not reflected at the political leadership table. It's reflected at the um, uh, at the leadership tables of uh, of many organizations. So um, I would say there's there's there there's so many leaders that are are, are working in not for profits and uh, and creating strategies for small businesses and supporting each other. They're just not choosing politics. And so, um, and maybe a little portion of this too is it's not necessarily just the choice; it's also the support that would come from around them um, to uh, to to be able to take that step. But um, I'd say, um, sort of similar to all these campaigns we're seeing for uh, encouraging more women and uh, and people from diverse uh, communities to run, it's ask when you're seeing great leaders that are, are are running amazing programs, creating, you know, stronger communities locally, um, tell them that you will be there to help them and show up. And uh, and I think that one by one, we'll be able to see that shift at the uh, at, at both the municipal and all of the different levels of political leadership. Um, I don't think it's for lack of the talent. I think it's, uh, it's just the matter of sort of shifting um, what it is that they're bringing to all of their leadership tables and, and putting it at council. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Yeah, just quickly, I uh, I said this to Anneke, and and I um, I would really love the opportunity to give some time, give give myself uh, uh, an, a chance to to speak with whoever, uh, maybe maybe some some formal or informal uh, mentorship of people that may have been in my position, uh, you know, um, now that I was thirty years ago. Um, give them perhaps some confidence that maybe I didn't have to stay and to make the place that that didn't exist at the time um, to imagine it and have the courage to build it. Um, you know, we've we've took our knocks and we've learned a few things. And and if I could do it all over again, knowing what I know now, I probably would. So maybe if I could um, help uh, through that, I think there's a way that we can scale. I. I uh, I don't know, I don't necessarily want to volunteer my uh, fellow panelists, but I think that there is an appetite uh, for us to uh, maybe we can scale what we're talking about now in some way, whether through the institutionalized setting at uh, Windsor or um, United Way or other or other civic movements. Um, I put me down for that. And I know this is being recorded, so I, I expect uh, you guys to hold me to this, but uh, you owe me 10 bucks anyway, Vincent, so I could come down and, and do that. But uh, I think that that could be part of it is to mobilize and to, you know, I'm still a Windsorite at heart. I've never left emotionally. My heart's still there. So it's still my hometown. Comes across uh, very, very clearly for sure, Sean, for sure. Others want to jump in on that? No, I think Jody? you're right. I think it's yeah. just, you know, it's a people, um, uh people feeling supported uh learning how to organize although they probably already know it but just understanding that you can apply it to that political context and uh yeah and you know if people want help uh you know i am certainly happy to to offer anything uh that that i can 
you know, I, I sit on the University Board of Governors as a way to, uh, I mean, I get a lot out of it too, but also as a, as a means of, you know, giving back to the community that was so helpful and essential to me, but you know, there's there's other ways to to do that, and I'm certainly I'm certainly open to that for sure too. Anyone else on this topic right now? Sean Mickelock, go ahead. Yeah, please. This is this is a long term thing, but I think like just teaching civics is going to be important because, uh, yeah, especially at the municipal level, because like it's the it's the most important. Uh, level of government to the day-to-day -day life of everyone runs with the stuff we bump into but it has like the lowest um, voter turnout in Canada um, I did I, I said I did my two political science degrees in Windsor and never once went to Windsor City Hall uh, which I'm totally embarrassed about um, and I go to Toronto City Hall all the time or metaphorically right my head is in there um, which is a terrible place to be um, but I, I, I just overlooked it it's like sexier stuff like more exciting stuff happens and higher up um, and get the younger generation. I think high school students in Ontario only have like a like half a credit of civics right now. Um, get that more in deeper into curriculums, bring kids to bring your kids to a city council meeting. Um, they won't hate it after a while, um, I hopefully. Um, just get them engaged at that level and, and don't do what I did and um, ignore it for the first 25 years of your life. Sorry, um, let me let me ask you folks. I mean, a lot of what we've talked about too comes down to sort of getting that story out or getting the word out, if you will. And I mean, it's, it's, I don't think that's necessarily a new concept. But what is it above everything else that you want Windsor to be saying to the rest, at, at the very least, at the rest of Ontario? Ab above all, there's so many messages and so many different things you could point to. But above all, rising all above it. What clearly does Windsor need to be saying for the rest of the province? Big deep questions, I'm telling you. Anyone take a crack at it? I think it just is just come. I think we're 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 too preoccupied with asking questions and 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 caught up. It's such a Windsor thing and a Canadian thing to 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 be so um, hypnotized by what and preoccupied with what people think of ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, Windsor has nothing to worry about. Windsor is 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 cool. It's mm -hmm. cool. It's the music, the food, the culture, um, the diversity, the capacity, the imagination, the arts, the grit. It's beautiful. It's fantastic. Just say, come on down. We'll show you a good time. Fully respond to the confidence. Fully do. Yeah. Fully and have it yourself. Yeah, I think uh, one thing is that excitement and being excited to like create a space for everyone. Like I think there is, um, you know, one thing that I feel is sometimes there's like, there's a certain lifestyle or a certain group of people that are really prioritized in how Windsor grows as a city. Um, there are people who are thrown under the underfunded bus. Um, so it's just like creating and being very clear that like we want, you know, like an urban lifestyle, suburban ones too, like, you know, that we want to make sure that there's a city that is, you know, benefits everyone and that creates that opportunity, that space. Um, I think that's like, you know, I mentioned quality of life as being the basis of like good talent attraction and retention, but I think it's just like that, like really like not only just like appreciating the diversity we already have, but just like kind of like expanding that and like expanding what that means and then being excited about that and then sharing that to the world. Just looking in the chat, you know, a lot of people jumping in talking about, you know, Windsor's got to believe in it itself and the you know, Windsor starts here. And, and there's, a, there's definitely a narrative and something that's come up really through our whole conversation together, really about at some point, this generation of, of, of community members here or, or beloved relatives afar, let's just move on. Let's just keep going. Let's keep trucking. Like move on, stop asking permission. And, and things are changing here in a positive way and probably have been for a long time. And let's move on from, from old, old issues and old narratives. And that's, that's very alive and well. And so many of the connective tissue between what, what all you folks have said and so what's going on in the chat. Others, in terms of what needs to be said loudly and clearly, any other responses to that? Above all, the loudly and clearly piece. Maybe, um, like, 
the the Detroit angle. Um, a lot of people, I, when I tell them I'm from Windsor, they say, "Oh, I passed through there on the way to Detroit or on the way to Chicago or, or whatever." But like, they didn't stop. It's like Windsor needs to put a speed bump in here on Church Line, but to like stop people from going. But I think maybe there's a way to capitalize on that. You know, like come come to Detroit. Windsor is the gateway to Detroit for Canadians, for Torontonians, for Montrealers, whatever. Stay in Windsor and go over to Detroit, but come back here because it's cheaper because we don't have the exchange rate. I don't know. Um, um, but also Windsor has, and I think, you know, when I, when I say I'm from Windsor, I'm actually from Tecumseh, but I think Windsor and Essex County are the same thing, even though I know there's in, internal tensions there, uh, hospital costs. Um, but um, the proximity of town and country to each other in, in Windsor and Essex is like amazing. Um, we have the green belt here in Toronto, but it's way out there. You have to, you have to ride, if you want to ride your bike, it's like two hours to get to a field um, or two hours in traffic. Whereas Windsor, you're like right there. Um, and I've, I, when I come home to visit mom who still lives in Windsor, um, I've, I've been bringing my bike and going on rides, which I used to do. And I've been really impressed with some of the, like the Herb Gray Parkway um, uh, bike infrastructure, but just like kind of the rail trail stuff going out into the county. And I rode to Amherstburg uh, last summer when I was in town. I would have never done that um, before because I didn't want to ride and die on a you know 900 kilometer an hour highway. Um, so that kind of infrastructure that that Windsor's already got is really interesting. And I think people you know people in this part of the province go to Prince Edward County for that sort of thing and and you know get an Airbnb and and ride their bikes on an old rail trail and go see wineries and, and Windsor has all those things. So. There's, I mean, there's, there's a lot here in terms of connected tissue. I'll go to Jody in, in, in a second. Um, also in terms of just, not just the, the momentum piece, but also the progress we've seen, you know, this event proper has been supported by six of our city councillors, many who have joined in many sessions, many of whom have contributed ward funds. I think that's actually really significant. I think it's significant that, uh, I believe it's tomorrow that our new CAO, Jason Raynard, is speaking here. I think that's significant. I think it's significant that all of the different community partners, which you Windsor is just one, are happy to be at the table and say, this is important, let's fund it, let's do it, let's be there, let's, let's open up that conversation. I think that's a significant piece. And for all of the actors that are part of bringing this together, um, that, that, that shouldn't be forgotten in all of this. That there's a lot of people pushing for change and a lot of people pushing into continued positive things that are not new at all. There's a lot of positive things going in Windsor for a long time, but we're, we're moving on and just keep going in, in a positive, active direction. I'll leave the last comment on, on that to Jody and we'll go to a final question. Jody. I'm going to try and choose my words carefully, but yeah. like when I when I lived in Windsor, one of the things I loved about it, and and I'll give some contemporary examples, but you know you could kind of endlessly reinvent yourself. You know, oh, I'm a you know I'm an artsy person. I go to the DIA. I you know hang out at the at the Windsor Art Gallery. Uh, no, you know, actually I'm a shopaholic and, you know, like I shop at Devonshire Mall and I go over to the States and, you know, I, I shop over there. Actually, I'm kind of a nature person now, you know, I ride my bike everywhere. I go out to the county. Windsor is a place where you can be whoever you want to be. Like there literally is, it, it's a mid-sized city, but, 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 but with Detroit, with the county, like, you literally can just be whoever you want to be. There is literally something for everyone. I didn't even mention the casino and all of the acts that, that come through there. Um, you know, I am not a gambler. I've been to, to Vegas a couple of times and I've never gambled. I, I go for the acts and I go for the desert that, that surrounds it. Like Windsor can be that too, right? Like you, you can go for the music when you find music that, that you like. You can go out and do wine tasting and you know, uh, and soon there will be cannabis farm gate, uh, you know, so, so literally what, what, whatever floats your boat, like you're, you'll, you'll be able to find something. So I don't think it sometimes when we, you know, I said earlier, like to, to tell the story, sometimes that means like one story, right? And, and, and I, don't, I don't think we should do that because, because I, th I, I, think it, I think it offers much, much more, like a, a much more dynamic and, and complex experience. And you can ratchet it up or you can scale it back down. Final question for the panel. We had to get to this question, so it's expected. What is your all time favorite, best in show parking lot in Windsor? Out of all of them, which one is the one that just, just, you know, 
can't even find the words. Which parking lot? Out of all of them, which we're going to go to pizza. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We'll go to pizza, even though that probably would have been even just as fun of a topic. Best pizza in Windsor. Where are we at? Go fight it out. I'm throwing Arcata on the table. Yeah, Arcata. Yes. Really? Okay. I like I like Arcata. Yeah, it's really good. Like I don't even. I also like the retro know. sign over on Dubo. I was like a Roma Trevi. You know, I'm an East Ender, right? Mm -hmm. And so I that those, those were my favorite pizza. Yeah, Trevi Torino, uh, but I think um, Riverside Pizza for the for the sports bar spin on it. Mm -hmm. River, sorry, Riverside Tavern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Others? The sauce. Julian or Tiffany? We'll still talk about the sauce. I will just throw in my vote for Arcata. Um, but I was excited about the parking lot question because there's one in, the one in downtown, which is like, like very sadly, like reconverted its bottom floor. Like I love looking at it and just thinking like, what if like, you know, we put like, that's where like the library went or like, what if all of Felicia was like, you know, I like, I like looking at that and kind of like imagining the future. So it's not a parking lot that I use for parking purses, purposes. It's one that I use for like imagination purposes and it makes me very happy. Well, you know what I mean? If we're charmed with the question, three minutes to go, let's go. Let's make that a real question. What is everybody's favorite parking lot for whatever reason? The most limited Devon, question ever. Devonshire Mall. Yeah. Just, uh, close to Dougal. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry, Howard, just north yeah. of EC Row, closest to EC Row, I think the, the bay entrance. Yeah. Because you can see the Detroit skyline over EC Row. Uh, and that's where I first saw the, um, the Concord. In the mid '80s, my parents drove us out there, and we looked. The executives were coming in from London, England, to Walkerville uh, to go to Hire Walker, and they took the um, they took the Concorde, and everyone was in the parking lot craning their neck, looking at the Concorde. And to me, that's a very vivid Windsor growing up, vivid Windsor memory for me. Others, others, favorite all time parking lot. I think the one at Goyo uh, and Pitt, Chatham, uh, yeah. has, has a spiral in the middle because um, it's really nice to go up to the top and park on the top. Uh, and they're ugly things, parking garages, but they always have really good views uh, that are accessible of the city. So whenever I'm anywhere, I always go up into the parking garage um, and, and, and it's always empty. <laughs> good tip, good tip. Others? Uh, Jody. I met the queen in the parking lot of like around Diep Gardens. Like she did a walkabout and her <laughs> it was like, oh, okay, well, we're gonna stand on asphalt, but all right. But, and I always go back there. I mean, it's just such a, it's such a beautiful view, right? I mean, you can just sit there and it's stunning. Tiffany, how about you? All time favorite parking lot in Windsor. I already told you, I, I didn't have a car when I lived in Windsor. I, I guess the casino, because I could walk right out from the <laughs> elevator straight into the building. Um, but I, I, I know we were at time, and I, I didn't get to answer the last question before of, uh, of the story that I hope Windsor can tell. Um, if I could create my own Netflix special, um, it would be to go back and be able to talk about the greatest freedom show on earth that Windsor um, has been in the past the home of, and um, and tell that emancipation story, and, and what we, as a uh, a city have uh, have have fostered, um, and I think that this moment uh, internationally, the UN Decade for People of African Descent, this is a moment that I would love to see Windsor as well, owning that part of our history and talking about the future of the African diaspora in Windsor as well. So that would be my off the cuff, not answer to your current question, but um, a, a story that I would love for us to tell a little bit better as well. Perfect note to end on. Tiffany Gooch, Jody Butts, Sean Hertel, Sean McAuliffe, and Julian Villafuerte Diaz. Thank you very, very, very much. Again, a giant thank you to CUI and certainly to Center for Cities and Annika Smith for putting this together. What a rock star 90 minutes we've spent together. This has been time well spent. And with just the idea of us, we're all moving forward. We're all moving on in all the best ways possible. Thank you very, very much. And thanks everyone for joining us. We'll see you at one of our many next sessions. Thanks everybody. Thank you.